All right, uh, before we jump into Ezekiel or jump back into Ezekiel, I wanted to, uh, to mention a discovery. You may have read about this, a discovery that was made on July 5th at the British Museum, but it was just reported in the papers last week. I don't know if it was Wednesday or Thursday in a couple of British newspapers. Now, based on these press reports, a Dr. Michael Gersa, who's an associate professor at the University of Vienna, he was at the British Museum, as he periodically has done since 1990, and he was looking through the Babylonian archives, and he's one of the people who can read cuneiform, and so he periodically goes and reads through uh, the archives there, and he was looking for financial records, and so he spends his time doing that. And he deciphered a cuneiform inscription on a small tablet that had been uncovered. The tablet was uncovered in the 1870s, and it's been in the British Museum since 1920. And here is the tablet. You see how small? It's smaller than a pack of cigarettes. And you see this cuneiform is these little wedge-shaped deals. Uh, that's the type of writing that it is. Well, this is a receipt that's dated to the 10th year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar II, which makes it 595 BC. Okay, so you know that this is now after Ezekiel's been in captivity, and it's two years before the vision that we read about. So this is a receipt of, that he finds here, and it, it was a receipt for a gift of gold that was made to a temple in Babylon, about a mile from modern Baghdad. And the exciting thing about it is that the donor who's identified in the receipt, the one who's giving the gift or the donation of gold to the temple, is Nebo Sarsakim, and he's Nebuchadnezzar's chief eunuch, and he happens to be the exact person identified in Jeremiah 39, verse 3, as being present at the fall of Jerusalem. So he's identified there by position, by name, on this inscription. And a fellow who is a, uh, one of the experts at the British Museum, a guy named Dr. Irving Finkel, he says, quote, a throwaway detail in the Old Testament, because if you see Jeremiah 39, 3, he just mentioned some of the people who were there. He says, a throwaway detail of the Old Testament turns out to be accurate and true. I think that it means that the whole narrative of Jeremiah takes on a new kind of power. Okay, these things are just interesting to me. So, you know, and I've, I've said before in other classes, as people attack the Bible, you know, they've said all kinds of things. You know, Sodom and Gomorrah didn't exist. And, you know, for a long time they said one of the Assyrian kings, I think Sargon, didn't exist because he was only referred to in the Bible. Then they discover his palace and... You know, so this stuff goes on. So here we have this, this little incidental detail, and uh, now we have a Babylonian record uh, that goes along with it. So I thought if you hadn't heard that, that you would like to know about it. Okay, a quick review here. The final stage of Ezekiel's commissioning as a prophet. We see that in chapter 3, verses 22 through 27. And then in chapters 4 and 5, Ezekiel, he symbolically portrays the coming siege of Jerusalem. And we talked about that last week. He builds a model and then he lays siege to it. He compares Judah's punishment to that of Israel. And he symbolizes the famine that the inhabitants of Jerusalem will experience during the siege and the defilement that they're going to experience during the exile. And then he portrays their fate through shaving his head and beard. You remember and burning a third of the hair and chopping it up, throwing it up and chasing after it with a sword. So he, he, he depicts here, he symbolizes that the the coming siege of Jerusalem. Then in chapter 6 and 7, this is a, uh, this is a, uh, uh, the coming judgment in those chapters is predicted. And that's where I wanted to pick back up. I, I got into that just a little bit uh, last week, but I wanted to pick back up in chapter 6 and chapter 7. Now, in these two chapters, these are relatively straightforward. If you've read them, you know they're, they're pretty straightforward predictions of doom and disaster coming to the, to the city or the town of city of Jerusalem and, and uh, to Judah. Now, chapter 6 is a, is a judgment on idolatrous Israel. Now, this is, means Judah. In other words, it's Israel as the remaining part of what was once unified Israel. So he's talking about judgment coming on Jerusalem. And I mentioned last week that idolatry, this was a standard way of worship in the ancient world. Okay, this is, this is how it was done. It was believed that, see, by making a likeness of the god or goddess, and then they would do some type of ritual that would invest the essence of that god in this image. But it was believed that they could bring the god near. And I mentioned the example of like is something a parallel like a voodoo doll. 
See, where what is done before this image, this, it's not just, the, you know, they look at it as in another illustration I, I ran across or an explanation was you could think of it how they perceive these idols would be something like a camera. Where we, if you're doing something before a camera, you understand that it is being done in the presence of people who are far off. Well, it's kind of like that, that we have a properly ritualized statue or image then is, is then seen as what I do before this thing is done in the presence of the deity this thing represents. And so this was how worship was done in the ancient world. All of, these, all of the religions around, they were, they were idolatrous, except Judaism. And this made it very difficult to maintain that because there was great cultural pressure on you to go ahead and engage in, in idolatry. See, all of the religions around. So here you are, you're now in you know, Canaan, and you want to grow crops, and you ask people there and say, how do you do? Oh, they say, well, you know, you go ahead and you make a sacrifice to this particular god or that particular god. That's how it's done. And also you have people who had, they would have a personal god, a family god, and a nation god or a national god. And so they would see no inconsistency in having Yahweh be the god of the nation that they would appeal to him when they're ready to go to war and those kinds of things, and then having uh, another god as their personal god they dealt with on a daily basis. Okay, so there are, there are a lot of things about idolatry that was, that was pulling them. It was the common way it was done, and also there are other things that are appealing about it. It's very convenient. I don't have to go to some centralized sanctuary. We can just have idols put up all over the place. It also made very few idolatrous religions, made few if any ethical demands on people. And they also, many of them in, engaged in ritual sex acts. And the idea was kind of a sympathetic magic where, you know, if this idol, I'm doing this in the presence of this idol, so I would go in and, you know, copulate with a temple prostitute. And the idea was is that that would spur the god to copulate with his consort, and then that would help bring about plant life and this kind of stuff. Okay, so you see that this is, I mean, there were, there were draws to this stuff, and it was very appealing. And so, in fact, orthodoxy, Jewish orthodoxy, faithfulness to the covenant was a minority view in Israel, and idolatry prevailed during most of the nation's history. They were always fighting this. And so here you see God is judging the idolatry. Now, the fact that it was a majority view, the fact that there was great cultural pressure and everything to engage in it, didn't matter one whit, it was an outrageous affront to God, it was spiritual adultery, and it was something that required punishment. And that's what you see in chapter 6, he is going to punish idolatrous Israel. He's going to bring his judgment against him, and God promises to bring this abomination, this idolatry that is rampant uh, in, in Judah, he's going to bring it to an end with the wholesale destruction and slaughter wrought by the Babylonians. I said, we listen to this and we say, well, you know, that's really, that's difficult. This is how God views sin. Okay, it is serious, serious business. And he promises that he's going to bring it to an end. But even in the midst of this destruction, a remnant is going to survive and in captivity come to realize the horror of what they have done to God. So he says that, you know, there's going to be a remnant that will survive and they'll realize who God is, that he cannot be mocked cannot be treated as irrelevant, cannot be ignored. He can't be treated that way, and they'll recognize just how serious he is about covenant loyalty. Okay, God enters into a covenant with us, and he demands, expects us to be loyal people. Okay, so he says in chapter 6 that there's going to be judgment on idolatrous Israel. In chapter 7, God announces that the disaster is imminent. The disaster is imminent. His wrath is coming in punishment of their wickedness, and all the things they trust in for security are not going to protect them. You know, they trust in a lot of different things for security, and he is telling them. His wrath is coming, his judgment is imminent, and the things they think will hold it off will not. Okay, there is nothing that is going to stall this. Their own strength will not stop the disaster. In verse 14, he says, you're going to muster an army and they're not going to go out. No, 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 we're going to be safe because our strength will protect us from another invasion of the Babylonians. No, it won't. Your strength will not. The wealth, their wealth will not stop the disaster. In verse 19, in fact, their love of wealth had lured them to iniquity and thus to judgment. They're going to be throwing the money away. You know, people who are very wealthy 
Wealth is power. That's true in any society. And people who are very wealthy tend to believe that I can trust in my wealth to get me out of difficult situations and I can buy off or you know, stall whatever judgment is coming. I just have to pay the right people, do the right things like that, and then when he says that's not going to happen. Your wealth's going to be useless to you and their religious environment would not stop the disaster. The temple which gave them a false sense of security, it is itself going to be destroyed. And you can see that in chapter, in verses 20, really 22, 20 through 22, mainly 22. So you see that the, the fact they're living there in, in Jerusalem, that's not going to be something that they consider and say, listen, this is not, you know, we're, we're safe from judgment because of the environment that we're in. Okay, in chapter 8, chapter 8, Ezekiel gets a, a visionary tour of the temple. In chapter 8, in verses 1 through 18, it's 14 months after his initial vision. Okay, you remember the vision 593 when he's sitting there by the Kabar Canal? So 14 months after that, he's given a vision while he's sitting in his home in Tel Aviv with the community leaders who had undoubtedly come there to inquire of the Lord. So here he is sitting in his home. He's got the community leaders with him. And then he's given a vision. In his vision, he is taken and transported to Jerusalem. I think he's still sitting there with them. This is a visionary experience. He goes there and he's transported, taken to Jerusalem... And outside the north gate of the inner court that surrounds the temple, Ezekiel sees an idol. Now this quite possibly is is an image of Asherah, who's the mother goddess of the Canaanite pantheon. If that's true, then she would have reappeared there after Josiah's reformation. Remember, Manasseh had an Asherah pole in the temple. And you can see it in 2 Kings. So it's quite possible that this has now reappeared. And though God's glory was still present in the temple, he tells Ezekiel in verse 6 that this idolatry is driving him away. He will not be there in the midst of this idolatry. See, there's only room for one God in God's temple. That's how it is. There's only room for one God in his temple. He will not share his place of worship with anything. Faith in God is exclusive. It is an all or nothing proposition. That's how it was, that's how it is. Now that's difficult for people and sometimes we don't like that, but that's the way it is. In the New Testament, you see both the church and individual Christians are referred to as the temple of God or the temple of the Spirit. And if we want God to remain with us, okay, if we want to be on His side or have Him on our side, we cannot worship anything in addition to Him. He cannot have rivalries for our devotion. Okay, simply cannot be the case. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. You see, now this is part of the message in Christianity that that our culture and society balks at. We don't like this idea. The idea that, wait a minute, you're telling me that this is exclusive, this is the only way that, that I have to make God everything in my life. He has to be the top priority in my life. I can't have him in one compartment and then have over here, you know, my whatever it is, my pleasure, my status, any of that stuff. He says, no, he has to be first place. He has to be the priority in your life. Must be. Okay, now you can pretend that that's not how it is and and create something that says, no, that's not true. But the fact of the matter is, no one can serve two masters. God has to be your master if you're going to be him and if you're going to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Ezekiel is then, he's shown the leaders of Judah. If you've read this, you know this. This is, uh, you know, he's taken, he's shown that the the leaders of Judah engaging in full-blown pantheistic idolatry in a hidden chamber of the temple. They're worshiping the divine as it's expressed in the life of animals. You saw they have these drawings and things. And this is this pantheistic, this idolatry. They're here worshiping. And Ezekiel has shown this. This is what they're doing. This blatant rebellion. Okay, just blatant rebellion against God is being rationalized with the claim that, well, God had abandoned the land. See, he had abandoned the land and he no longer saw. See, he no longer saw or cared about or was interested in what went on there. You can see that in verse 12. Chapter 8, you can also see that in, in chapter 9, verse 9. See, they reasoned from their hardship that God wasn't there and they concluded that their sin would go unpunished. He's over here. He's not, you know, he has abandoned us. He's not concerned with us. That's how they rationalize this blatant sin. 
And so he's not watching us. He doesn't see what's going on. Now, however much it may appear, okay, however much it may appear that God does not exist or doesn't care or doesn't have the power to bring judgment, don't be deceived. Okay? Don't be deceived. However it looks to you. Say, no, no, you know, he's not here. I see suffering in the world. God's not here. He's abandoned the world. He doesn't really care. He's not watching. However it looks to you like that. Don't be deceived into thinking that God will not hold us accountable. He knows our sin and will hold us accountable. Okay, it's not like, look, he doesn't see, he's not aware. That's what they're, that's what they're doing. Now, Ezekiel then has shown women in the outer court of the temple and they're weeping over the death of Tammuz. Now, Tammuz is a Sumerian Babylonian god of plant life. And she was believed that she died in the fall and came back to life in the spring. And then he sees at the very door of the temple a group of men, almost certainly priests, at the door of the temple, and they were literally turning their backs on God to worship the sun. They're turning their back to the temple and they're worshiping the sun. This is happening in in Jerusalem. This is going on in Jerusalem after God has exiled people in 605, after he has exiled people in 598 and 597. They're just sitting here just still going crazy just sinning like crazy and God promises to judge the people for those abominations. They may think he's away. They may think he's not looking. Oh, but he's looking. He's aware. He understands. And he is going to judge the city for what's going on there. Then in chapter 9, verses 1 through 11, he summons his divine executioners. God summons these executioners and six of them appear at the temple accompanied by a seventh who's dressed in white and he's carrying a writing kit. He then instructs the man in white, who's an angel, instructs the man in white to put a mark on the foreheads of those who mourn over the sins of the city. So he says, you go, you go through and you mark the forehead of those who are mourning the sins of Jerusalem, who are sitting here and just going, oh, you know, this is something that we're doing, treating God like this. You mark them that way. And then after demonstrating his readiness to judge by moving his glory from the threshold, or moving his glory to the threshold of the temple. Okay, his, sim- his readiness to judge, he now moves to his glory to the threshold of the temple and then commands the executioners to follow behind the marking angel, slaughtering everyone in the city except those with the mark. Like I said last week, we don't like this. You know, this is kind of like, well, you know, who is this God? Well, this is the holy and righteous God. That's who this is who will not tolerate this. And he says, he sends his executioners and they go slaughter everything in the the city without the mark and they do so beginning with the elders in front of the temple. Now this vision, it makes or reinforces several points. Okay, and the first is is that, look, the coming destruction, this destruction that is coming on on the city of Jerusalem, it represents God's judgment. Not simply a Babylonian military success. Okay? It represents God's judgment. He is bringing them. He is bringing them on the city. And they are going to destroy it. And secondly, there are so few, if any, within the city who are righteous that the bodies being piled up in the temple, they prompt Ezekiel to cry out in fear that all would be killed. I mean, you have to get this picture. They're just being slaughtered and piled up. And he cries out that all of them are going to be killed. And God's response is simply that the slaughter is in proportion to their sin. What he is doing is in proportion to their sin, which suggests that the point of the vision is the amazing extent of the city's wickedness. This city had just gone crazy. It had lost its moral, you know, north star. It's just living as though God wasn't there and doing what it wanted to do, doing what it did by power. And in verse 11, it it might indicate that in fact some people were marked, not necessarily, but it may indicate that some were marked, and if that's the case, then the additional point is that despite the magnitude of the slaughter, it it wouldn't be complete, that God would preserve a righteous remnant. Okay, but this is a powerful picture here. Then in chapter 10, chapter 10, it says the, uh, uh, the throne, you see here, the throne chariot of chapter 1 and chapter 10 
You see that? You remember the throne chariot and that awesome image? Well, it, it appears again here in chapter 10. And the Lord commands the, the, quote, man in white, the man in linen, to fill his hands with burning coals from among the cherubim and to scatter them over the city. Okay, this, of course, symbolizes this is God's wrath. He's taking these coals from the cherubim and he says, spread them over the city. And these coals are part of God's glory and purity. And they consume all that is not holy. And so here we have this angel who takes these coals from the cherubim and spreads them over the city. It is punishment. It is judgment. And God is bringing it. And we need to learn. There are many lessons for us to learn from, from what he does here. Now God's glory is in the process here of departing the temple in chapter 10. It's a movement that accelerates in chapter 11. Remember he moves, he's moving because of the idolatry and the sin. In verse 18, the glory moves from the threshold of the temple. It moves to the east gate. You remember, first to the threshold. He's on his way out. Then the glory moves to the east gate, and it's poised to leave the city, and it does leave the city in chapter 11, verse 23. So God is abandoning Jerusalem because of its sin, because it would not live as he deserves to have them live. He calls them to live. He's abandoning the city. Then you see in chapter 11, verses 1 through 13, you see this judgment comes on, on Jerusalem's evil leaders. Okay, in chapter 11, verses 1 through 13, at the east gate, Ezekiel observes, he sees an, there's an assembly of 25 city officials. They're gathered there at the east gate, 25 of them, and God declares that they plot evil and give wicked advice. And here's what they're saying. Okay, these leaders who are gathered in Jerusalem, after all that has happened to the city, they're sitting there and they're saying, is it not nearly time to build houses? The city is the pot, and we are the meat. Okay, this is their take on things. See, as leaders, they're claiming, look, the threat of further Babylonian deportation was about to be taken care of. Isn't it time, you know, to start to build houses? Hasn't this problem pretty much worked itself out? Haven't we, with our diplomacy and fortification as the leaders, haven't we resolved this issue? Further threat is not really a problem. Let's go ahead. Isn't it time for us to go ahead and be comfortable and at peace and assured that further deportation and assault on the city is not going to occur? So they're sitting here and saying this to the people. They were falsely preaching a sense of security that that was all but achieved despite their continuing wickedness. And this is how people can be, right? They can sit here and just be sinning right in God's face and then sit here and say, no, everything's fine. Everything's fine. I can just sin blatantly in God's face, poke him in the eye, live the way I want, and everything I know is fine with God. It's peace, peace. And so this is what, this is what they're claiming they're saying, they're preaching that security, look, it's all but a done deal. It's all but wrapped up, despite their continuing wickedness, and contrary to God's prophetic word, despite what God had said. Had said in the past and was saying now. See, as leaders, that's, you, know, you can see why they do this. They'd say, listen, you know, we've, we've taken care of this through our diplomacy or our fortification. Now, being meat in the pot. When they say that, when, when the idea, when they say the city's the pot and we're the meat, being meat in the pot means that they saw those who are left in Jerusalem as the desirable part that is kept. You know, that's, that was the good stuff, the meat in the pot that was kept as opposed to the undesirable parts that were discarded as the deportees had been. So here they are staying in Jerusalem. You've got a bunch of people who've been deported and they're sitting here saying, listen, we're protected, we're the meat in the pot. See, we're the right ones, even though they're blatantly sinning. And they're saying, okay, you know, it's okay, things are settling down. Now, we are the meat that is worthy of being kept. That's why we're still here. The riffraff, that which isn't worthy of being kept, has already been tossed out of the pot. They have been deported. Well, Ezekiel prophesies about this state of affairs. And he says, look, God knows their thoughts, that they secretly fear the sword. You see that in verses 5 and 6 and verse 8. They really fear the sword, and well, they should. They had murdered many people in Jerusalem, and it was those people they murdered, he says, who are the meat, meaning the choicest parts of the citizenry. They'd kill the good people. 
And then here they're sitting there going, no, it's, you know, this is about taking care of. You know, this is about taking care of. Don't worry about further assault or deportation. Go ahead. Isn't it about time to start building? See, the leaders, on the other hand, they had murdered the choicest part of the citizenry, but they, on the other hand, they're going to be driven from the city. This is what Ezekiel tells them. They're going to be driven from the city, captured and executed by the Babylonians. See, rather than being the meat, as they were claiming, they were going to be thrown out as unfit to eat. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened, as you can see in 2 Kings 25, verses 18 through 21, and I'm sure elsewhere. See, God again makes clear here in, in, in verses 1 through 13 of chapter 11. He makes clear that this judgment is a result of their refusing to follow his decrees and laws. I don't know, you know who we think God is. That the Almighty, who has given us life and breath and everything else, he has created us, that we can sit here and just treat him like, I have to do what you say. Who are you? you know, who, who are you? It's like, you know, and then again and again and again and with his amazing patience as he calls and pleads. And I don't know, but here you see it, and this is, you know, pretty typically human, but he makes clear that his judgment is a result of their refusing to heed his decrees and laws. And instead, he says in verse 12, they conform to the standards of the nations around them. See, he calls them this, and you're to be a beacon. And what do they do? They said, now listen, this is too difficult to be odd. This is too difficult in a culture and world that looks down on this kind of thing. We want to be like the other people. They all practice idolatry. I don't want to be an oddball. I don't want to look at as strange. I want to fit in. I want to fit in. And so there's tremendous pressure here. And he holds that against them. It's not noble to say, listen, though God asked me to be a certain way, I want to be like the people around me. <laughs> See, we think that's a great thing. It's not. Okay? It's not. And so he says to them, look, he holds that against them, that they wanted to they conform to the standards of the nations. Now, as he was prophesying, as, as Ezekiel's prophesying, he sees Pelatiah, who's one of the leaders, he sees him drop dead. Okay, now this brings home to Ezekiel. This death brings home to him the reality of the promised judgment, which prompts him to again cry out on behalf of his people. He, he fears that Israel will be ended. He gets it. You see, you got other people just bopping around. Yeah, it's no big deal. Yo, you know, this is nothing. He gets it. He sees the wrath of God. And when he sees this fellow drop dead, he's saying, man, you know, this could be the end. I mean, everybody could be killed. And so he cries out to God. He cries out to him on behalf of the people. Then in chapter 11, verses 14 through 25, you see that those in Jerusalem, you had people in Jerusalem, and probably a good number of people in Babylon thought this way also. But you had those in Jerusalem, they deceived themselves into believing, see that the exiles, those who were in, in Babylonia, that they were God's unclean castaways. See, the people in Jerusalem are saying, you know, we're the meat in the pot. He's gotten rid of the, you know, the unclean. He's kicked them out. And so we're here, and for us, it's all good. They saw themselves as the true heirs of the holy city. They encouraged the exiles, look, to stay away. <laughs> you know, you guys are really what brought this. You guys go ahead and stay away. And then rather than accepting God's clear and obvious revelation, they falsely read a message of blessing out of their circumstances. See, this is how they're reading this thing. Look, 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 this is good for us. See, we're here. You guys have nothing to do with it. And God tells the exiles. He tells them that contrary to that conventional wisdom, it is they who are the future of Israel. These people sitting over here in exile who are beat and dejected, they are the future of Israel, not those remaining in Jerusalem. They are the future of Israel, despite how unlikely it appears. Can you imagine hearing that message? You're sitting here as a captive of this tremendously powerful nation. You're a nothing. You're a group of prisoners, you know, in a Jewish colony. And you've got somebody prophesying to you and saying, listen, you know, the, the future of Israel is in your hands. It's not in the hands of those who are left there. God is going to bring this scattered and powerless group of people back home. 
And they will rid Judah of the idolatry and rebellion. They're going to do it. They will return a penitent people, a people serious about their faith. They are, God is going to bring them back. And of course you know that this happened. And that's precisely what happened, beginning with Zerubbabel's return in 538 B.C. You remember how this happens, where Cyrus comes up and the, the Babylonians are defeated? And Cyrus declares that, okay, you guys can go home. Now, of course, your skeptic said for a long time, ah, that's not true. Uh, you know, that just is stupid. Why would he ever do that? He's got this labor here and all this stuff. Okay, and then they found the Cyrus Cylinder. Okay, the Cyrus Cylinder shows on it that his policy was that the captives could return. Well, what do you know? The Bible was right again. And all the people said, no, the Bible's stupid. Well, it just keeps showing itself right. Okay, but this is what happened. You have with the return of Zerubbabel and then through Ezra and Nehemiah in 458 through 433. You have Jews returning from exile, correcting abuses and reestablishing righteous religion and obedience to the Mosaic law. Okay, now in chapter 11, in, in 11 verses 19 and 20, I think that probably looks ahead to the spiritual renewal under the new covenant. Okay, and I'm going to talk about that more when we get to chapter 36. But you have this idea, see, you have in part a fulfillment. God is going to do this work. He's going to bring the exiles back to Jerusalem. But the Old Testament ends on a note of unfulfilled hope. Yes, they come back and the, and the nation is there and a temple is rebuilt. But there's just, it doesn't seem to have the glory that is promised. And so there is this expectation of something more. And then you have the intertestamental period of roughly 400 years. And that's when Jesus, that's the environment in which Jesus comes and he says, the kingdom of God is at hand. You see, but, but there, is, there is this fulfillment, but it's not complete. There is something that is, that is still to be fulfilled and that brings us to Christ. But we'll talk about that more in chapter 36. Now the glory of the Lord, it proceeds out of the temple, symbolizing God's rejection of wicked Judah, that that, that, that rejection had come to pass. And then Ezekiel then feels himself brought back to Mesopotamia. The vision ends, and he tells the exiles there what the Lord had showed him. Now, how'd you like to be sitting in that circle? How'd you like to be in that home group or, you know, family circle? They come, they're gathering around there to get a word from the Lord and says, Ezekiel says, I got one for you. Now, here it is. And so that'd be pretty powerful. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 16. Those in exile, see, the, the future of Israel... He again describes them as rebellious, as a rebellious house who do not see or hear Ezekiel's message. So here they are, they're, they're the exiles, they're going to be, you know, the future of Israel. And he describes them again as a rebellious house. See, the truth of national destruction, it was so hard for them to swallow that they continued to doubt Ezekiel's clear word, God, God's clear word through Ezekiel. It was just too, you know, it's just too difficult. I just don't want to hear this. It's so hard to swallow. I mean, so God gives them another chance to understand. But I thought about that. You know, we become so obtuse when God's message is unpleasant to us. It's like, you know, all of a sudden, you know, what, what does is mean? You know, we're sitting here going, you know, he sits here and says, you need to repent. You need to stop these things. Well, what is that? You know, what is really, uh, what's repent? And, you know, what's uh, fornication? And what's this? What's lying? I mean, you know, does he really mean that? And you see here, it's so difficult for them, though he's saying it plainly and plainly, there's this resistance to it because they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. And he says, so he gives them another chance. And here, here in, in chapter 12, verses 1 through 16, Ezekiel here, he, he prepares an exile's bag and he carries it to another location. He's going to act out something again. He prepares this exile's bag and carries it to another location. Then at dusk, he digs through the wall. I assume this is some wall that's been created for purposes of symbolism. But he digs through the wall and his doing so, that symbolizes a breach in the city's defenses. Okay, now there's, a, there's the, the wall that existed that separated the Babylonians from them has now been breached. He digs through that and then he carries the bag out like an exile with his face covered in shame and sorrow. And he is saying here, the exile is coming. Jerusalem is going to be attacked and people are going to be exiled. And because some still didn't understand, he spells it out. 
he spells out that this symbolized exile for the inhabitants of Jerusalem in verses 10 and 11. He simply tells them that, including Zedekiah, the current reigning king. He spells it out, including Zedekiah, whose escape and attempt, his escape and capture is elaborated on in verses 12 through 14, and that happened exactly. You remember he was taken before uh, Nebuchadnezzar at Riblah, his sons are killed, he's blinded, and then he's carted off into captivity. And this is what happened. He said this is what was going to happen. God told him it was going to happen, and that's what happened. Zedekiah is snared on his way out. Now, some didn't, you know, they didn't believe it, so he had to just lay it out for him. Now, God would permit some to survive and go into exile, he says. He's going to permit some to survive and go into exile so that they may tell of their wickedness and thus confirm that the exile was a demonstration of God's greatness, a fulfillment of of covenant punishment. You see, it is to God's glory. They're going to go and confess their wickedness to the people in exile so it'll be clear, look, this is a demonstration of God's greatness in that he said he would punish those as he gave the nation, he brought Israel into this land and he said, if you treat me like a dog, you will be exiled. You treat me that way and you will be exiled. And as he did that, he vindicated his honor and his name and his glory and those people he left to go into captivity to confess their wickedness, then people will see this wasn't some failure on God's part. That's not what happened. Some more superior God didn't come and, and whip God. That's not what this is. This is God's judgment in fulfillment of his promise to his glory. You say they would see that. And so one of the things I think about in looking at this is that, look, when we doubt God, we need to adjust our perspective. I could see people sitting there saying, listen, this looks really like God has abandoned us. God has been defeated. His people are carted off. Look, it's a defeat. If he was really the all-powerful God, how could any of this happen? Well, when you're tempted to think that way, when you're tempted and when you look and you see the wicked prosper, and you see the righteous who are getting kicked around and all that kind of thing, we need to adjust our perspective. Okay? God is God. He is on the throne. He was on the throne at the flood. He is in control. He is ruling. And even if it doesn't look like it, you see, we then need to search for what is the proper perspective that we are to have as disciples of Christ to see the glory of God in what looks like his absence. You see, that will help you if you can hold on to that. Now he says in verses 17 to 28, I heard that bell. He said in verses 17 to 28, he said, Ezekiel then acts out eating and drinking in fear. Okay, he's sitting here and he's, you know, he's doing this. He acts out this eating and drinking in fear and this depicts the fear and anxiety that the besieged inhabitants are going to experience in the last days before the conquest. See, again, it's, it's coming because of their wrongdoing. He makes this clear over and over again. God is going to put an end to this proverb, he says. They were quoting this proverb that says, look, the days are prolonged and every vision comes to nothing. You had people, this is what they would say. The days are prolonged and every vision comes to nothing. See, the people of Jerusalem, they had come to ignore prophecies about the destruction of the city because those prophecies had circulated for so long without coming to pass, that they started to tell you, ah, that's just, you know, talk, that's just nonsense. You know, things continue to go on as they have. You know, they belittled warnings of doom as something that people were always claiming, but never occurred. Look, I mean, I'm tired, yeah, 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 Judah's going to fall, Judah's going to fall, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm tired of hearing it. I'm tired of hearing it. The days are prolonged, every vision comes to nothing. You'd had the destruction of Judah and the judgment of Judah prophesied for at least since the 8th century B.C. For example, you can see it in Amos chapter 2, Hosea chapter 5, Micah chapter 1, Isaiah chapter 22. Okay, so we're down here now. We're in the 500s, not in the 700s. So this has been out there for a long time, and they got lulled into this sense that because it has been slow in coming, it's baloney. It's not coming. Something has happened. They mistook God's mercy and patience for inability or disinterest. 
And people do the same thing today. They've done it for a long time. You can see in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 10, for centuries, skeptics have mocked the return of Christ as something that's always talked about but never occurring. And all I can say to you is don't mistake God's, God's forbearance for non-existence or impotence. Don't make that mistake. As surely as he judged Judah, that day is coming. As surely as he judged Judah, they were sitting there saying, every prophecy comes to nothing. This is all baloney. As surely as he judged Judah, he is coming and he is going to judge the world. Okay? And you can take that to the bank. Now those who minimize Ezekiel's prophecy by claiming that it's for, there were some who claimed, look, this is for a distant future. He says, flatly contradict them. I am coming now. I'm not going to postpone anymore. And I just think about, you know, there's no end to the excuses that we can come up with for not taking God's word seriously. I mean, you know, he's saying this stuff as plain as the nose on my face, and they can still come up with a way of saying, no, that's not what's happening. That's, not, that's just how we are. But he says you flatly contradict them when they come up with that dodge. Because the truth of the matter is, he is coming in judgment against Judah, and the truth of the matter is he's coming in judgment against the world. Okay, chapter 13 we got just about a few seconds, so I'm not even going to start on that. Chapter 13, we'll pick up there next week if I remember. Okay, thanks for coming.